The wedding of Charles and Camilla finally took place on April the 9th, 2005. It had been delayed for 34 years because they'd been married to other people, and then for a day because the Pope died. The wedding was meant to boost Charles's image, and the royals hoped it would bring an end to the negative publicity he's been getting. Over the last 30 years, Prince Charles has been attacked and mocked, sometimes because of his behaviour and sometimes because of his often odd ideas. To some, Charles is ahead of his time, even a genius. To others, he's, if not mad, maddening, brilliant or bonkers or both. Tonight, we probe the mind of the man who has waited longer to be king than any other heir to the throne. This amusing 30-year-old film shows the prince as you've never seen him. The clown prince, not the crown prince. Once, people thought Charles was funny. And they thought he was a bit of a hero. You should be king, you should be king. <laughs> he even had the press eating out of his hand. And I rather feel that uh, being here today is uh, rather like asking a pheasant to award uh, the prizes to the best shot, because I've only got a few pellets in my backside, and you haven't yet brought me down. But then the public mood changed, and people started to laugh with him less and at him more. Yes, what is it, Muriel? You're nuts, sir. That's putting it mildly. Last year, for the first time, a poll found more people wanted William rather than Charles to step up to the top job when the Queen dies. So, after over a thousand years of monarchy, people are asking what once it would have been treason to ask. Should Charles become king at all? Why did Charles become a figure of fun? Partly because he's given us his opinions on pretty much everything. Three subjects in particular make Charles mad and maddening. Religion, medicine and architecture. In 1984, the prince denounced plans for a modern extension to the National Gallery as a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a well-loved and elegant friend. I think when he talks about monstrous carbuncles and... and um you know, puts architectural practices out of business, which has happened, and, and th that is, is questionable. It becomes dodgy when, when he starts, you know, when people's livelihoods start, when he starts interfering. And then there's God. Charles's ideas on religion defy a long, significant tradition. For the last 500 years, the British monarch has been supreme head of the Church of England and defender of the faith the Christian faith. But Charles has said he wants to be defender of all faiths. He's praised Islam, Sikhism, Buddhism, Judaism, the Greek Orthodox Church, and many far more unorthodox beliefs. If he can't, in all honesty, be supreme governor of the Church of England, then, um, then perhaps abdication. Prince Charles's views on medicine are very controversial. Since 1982, he's been arguing British doctors need to treat not just the human body, but also the human soul. Such an approach uh, may be given any number of descriptions. It may be described as psychotherapy or religion or the power of prayer or whatever. I uh, just think he is so wrong about medicine, but he is surrounded by people who just reinforce his prejudice. In 2004, the prince even suggested coffee enemas can prevent and cure cancer as part of the controversial Gershon diet. How will your highness take your coffee today, sir? Down the hatch or up? The blue enema bag has been specially designed to take not instant coffee, but a special organic brand. There's not a shred of evidence that it does any good, that it is ineffective and toxic. Where do these bizarre therapies come from? The answers turn out to be quite surprising.
I felt I just had to go. Lawrence van der Post was famous for his mystical beliefs and his influence over the rich and powerful. Some people would say he's responsible for the wackier side of the prince. I mean, if I ever hear a speech in which Prince Charles says that he believes in flying saucers, I know where it comes from. Van der Post's inf influence was probably less on the med medical side. I think it was much more, um, what's it all about, Alfie? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it was philosophical and, and, and spiritual. The prince's daily life is bizarre too. Charles, for all his attempts to find out how the other half lives, to show an interest in the less fortunate in society, for all that, he has two men paid by the state to help him get dressed in the morning. <laughs> in his youth, he even needed help with girls. I fixed him up with so many girls. He used to go to my attic and they bring all these girls there. And we used to play jokes, practical jokes, and him and, 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 and lock the door up. <laughs> After sowing his wild oats, Charles had to do his royal duty and marry a virgin who could produce an heir. They seemed happy when they got engaged. But the marriage was soon in trouble and the public have always blamed Charles for its failure. When the problem started, Charles turned to his mentor, Lawrence van der Post, for help, a decision that would affect the rest of his life. Sir Lawrence called in one of his closest friends, who was a psychotherapist called Dr. McLashen, and referred Charles to McLashen, and in, in turn, Princess Diana was referred to McLashen, and indeed, Charles continued to see McLashen for many years as an analytic experience. Do we know who the Prince's analyst now is? Yes, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> oh, that's mean of you. How did the most famous baby in the world end up on an analyst's couch? After the break, we reveal some of the key moments that led Prince Charles into therapy. It has just been announced from Buckingham Palace that Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, was safely delivered of a prince at 9.14 p.m. Charles was born to sit on the throne, not lie on the analyst's couch, but his early upbringing was not likely to make him feel very secure. The best parents praise and love and acknowledge and support and care for their child, which gives the child the ability to reach their potential. A heavy programme of official engagements prevents the princess and the duke from seeing their son as often as they wish. Psychologists claim the first five years of a child's life can make or break. But Charles's parents were very young and very busy. There's no doubt the Queen adores Charles and he adores her. But the Queen is a strange woman. She is not enormously tactile. When he was a baby, she would bath him and she would sit him on her knee and she'd read him stories. But I think there's very little sort of evidence that, that as he grew older, she kept up that, that um, the, the, the holding and the, and the touching. Um, she's really a woman who I think is much more comfortable with, with animals. Here's wishing a very important young gentleman many happy returns of the day on his third birthday. On Prince Charles's second birthday and his third birthday, neither mum nor dad were there. Children understand love by the amount of time that you spend with them. That's their way of knowing how important they are to you. So to neglect your children on what is considered the most important day in, their, in, their, in the year, their birthday, is disastrous. It has been nearly five months since the Queen was with her children, though she has kept close contact with them throughout her tour by radio telephone. Even when Charles was travelling with his parents, they often left him to the staff. Like in Gibraltar, when Charles and Anne went to see the famous Barbary apes, it was with the nannies. But there were perks. When he was four, Charles was voted one of the ten best-dressed men in the world. Charles was always a very sensitive child. 
What Philip wanted was a man's man. He wanted a tough little boy. He wanted Princess Anne. At the age of 13, Prince Charles was sent off to his father's old school, Gordonston, where the education stressed physical activities. At school, Charles discovered he liked acting. When he played in Macbeth, it made headlines all over the world. He was miserable for about three years there. Nobody would make friends with him because they, no, they didn't want to suck up. So he was very lonely. He just managed to sort of come to terms with and settle in when they sent him off to Australia. And so he, he spent another year sort of trying to, to make friends and settle in. And then he was shipped back to Gordonston to take his A-levels. And it's a miracle that he got as many as he did. And, and then, of course, people said, oh, well, you know, he, he, he didn't get into Cambridge on merit. It was only because he was Prince of Wales. Look at those miserable results. Most students with a B and a D at A-level would never have got to Cambridge in the first place. The occasion was both informal and formal with Lord Butler introducing Prince Charles to Mr. Dennis Marion, the senior tutor. Initially, he, he was, I think, quite nervous. The first suggestion coming from probably government circles was that we should, he should come up for two years and we would uh, set up special courses for him and so on and so forth, give him a general education. Well, uh, as soon as I interviewed him, uh, I could see that quite obviously if he wanted to do an honours degree, uh, he could. And obviously that there would be more pressure on him than an ordinary undergraduate. And so a new boy joined the ranks of the freshmen at Cambridge. I have a mind. Uh, Here he let his hair down a bit. He discovered that he liked playing the fool and had a talent for it. It was hilarious. Of course, one of the things he's always been incredibly good at doing is imitating. You've probably noticed this. Aren't you? And he, he can not only imitate people, but he, he can imitate noises terribly well. I love imitating and mimicking, and I enjoyed it enormously at school and university, the actual business of acting. In a strange way, um, so much of what one does requires, I find, acting ability in one way or another. Oh, he's having a whale of a time because he was totally relaxed and doing subjects that he thoroughly enjoyed doing. He's obviously, obviously always been interested in history and uh, I remember one of his supervisors said to me that uh, he obviously enjoys this subject. After all, it's mostly about his own family. But there was no playing for laughs when, ten months before his finals, Charles was invested as Prince of Wales. The sword about his waist the coronet upon his head, the gold rod in his hand. In giving to the prince these insignias of office, the queen could not conceal the gentle touch of a mother. Perhaps some people would think that uh, it is rather anachronistic and out of place in, uh, in this world, which is perhaps uh, somewhat cynical. But um, I think it, it can mean quite a lot if, if one goes about it in the right way. Not the sort of thing that an ordinary undergraduate had to put up with, with a, an honours examination just around the corner. And that's really why the, his, his grades slipped to, to a, a lower second in his second examination. He, he said to me, um, said it was the last, probably the last time uh, he would ever be able to do exactly what he wanted to do without any interference from outside. After Cambridge, Charles went into the Navy. It was his first job, a chance to prove himself, and the Navy was in his blood because his great-uncle Louis Mountbatten had been Admiral of the Fleet. Mountbatten, who he revered very much and, and I, I, I'm sure loved very much as, as, as his uncle, uh, he looked up to him and I think he wanted to do well in the Navy for his uncle's sake. Technically, Charles is a rear admiral but the only ship he's ever commanded is a small minesweeper. Great chap. He was uh, self-deprecating humour, he's intelligent, hard-working, focused. Um, I, I know it's contrite to say, but he has that elusive thing called officer-like qualities. I think it gives one a, a very useful um, experience, very useful experience of responsibility and discipline. I think responsibility is the most important thing is the actual trust that's put in you to deal with other people. Because then you can break through the, the pressure where you understand 
and we would then avoid the danger of being sucked in alive. We were on exercise off Anglesey, and unfortunately, when we came to weigh anchor in the morning to, to move as a squadron, Prince Charles pulled his anchor up to find the Tross um, Channel telephone cable was hooked on his, the flukes of his anchor. And they spent a long time trying to get rid of that cable. And it never, they didn't. So, so finally they had to ditch uh, one and a half shackles, I think it was, of uh, phosphor bronze chain which is probably the most valuable thing that, that um, naval mine hunters carry. The Navy criticised Charles. Three months later, he stood down from active service, sent off by his shipmates, who draped him with a toilet seat. Silly Productions present a horror film. As he left the Navy, Charles reverted to being a clown and made three psychologically revealing comedy films, revealing because he's quite endearing and vulnerable. Because you've got bigger legs than that, have? Absolutely. You think no. you can tell me what to do? Yeah. Look, I will tell you one thing and one thing only. Before we finish, I'm in charge. Oh, your fault. Not my fault. Me? I charge. It is your fault. You don't remember. No. You get it all wrong. No, it's your fault. Don't smile at me. Well, I'm going to make a pilot out of you if it kills me. I love it, that's too, you stupid man, you. That's because I've got shorter legs than him, it's not fair. He was telling me a story about, uh, I think it was fundraising or something, uh, on a walkabout in, uh, in Salisbury, I think it was for the Cathedral Roof. And lots and lots of people there, and he was going up and chatting to people. And he met a big, fat Welsh woman. And um, this Welsh woman said, oh, I'm so delighted, you know, look at you, you, you have a, our, our Prince of Wales. And out of the blue, she said, I'm just recovering from a mastectomy. And straight away, he said, ah, oh, you must be feeling pounds lighter. To which she fell apart laughing and, uh, you know, took it all in good, good stead. I mean, to come back quickly like that, uh, you saw I, I, lots of examples of that sort of thing all the time with him. After the Navy, Charles never had a full-time job again, other than being the Prince of Wales, and no one really knows what that job means. In his public appearances, Charles would show off his self-deflating humour. But often, the clown is only a mask. Behind the mask, there's a hunger to be serious. In 1973, Charles met the man who'd influenced that side of his personality. There are things in one's life that one doesn't talk about. There's no harm in that. There are certain relationships which is wrong to let the world in on it because it doesn't belong to the world. It's not part of the world and the world spoils it. When Lawrence first met the prince, the prince expressed an interest in Jung and Lawrence sent him to his wife, which is itself slightly dubious. As a patient? Yes. Van der Post's hero, Carl Jung, was one of the most famous psychoanalysts ever. Jung believed we're driven by spiritual needs as much as by sex. Images of gods, demons and devils fill our dreams. Prince Charles became a believer. Now, Lawrence, who had known Jung fairly well and was obsessed with Jung, in fact, volunteered, of course, that uh, he would be happy to uh, explain Jung and introduce uh, him, uh, the prince to Jung's work. And that led to a relationship of more than 20 years, during which I have no doubt whatsoever that Lawrence was the single most important influence on Charles's personal development. So much so that in 1977, he and Van der Post went to Kenya. They were repeating a trip Jung made 52 years earlier, which became an important voyage of self-discovery. Lawrence was an immense flatterer. He deluged him with letters and memoranda which were constantly praising this young man. He compared him with the finest thinkers of our time. He assured him that what he had said was full of great wisdom and uh, yeah, how he uh, To an impressionable youngish man, it would, I think, have been very impressive. 
Van der Post and Jung would have an enormous influence on Charles's ideas about medicine, architecture and religion. Charles seems to have needed the wisdom of the elders. One other older man who influenced him was his great uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten. He was much tougher on the young prince than Van der Post. Once, when Charles changed his holiday plans and made much more work for others, Mountbatten went ballistic. Mountbatten wrote a very stern letter to him saying that your behaviour is totally indefensible. You're becoming just like your great uncle David. I see all the same sort of frivolity and um, irresponsibility coming out. You must take a pull. You must not become like your great uncle David. Think what happened to him. Prince Charles's uncle David, known as King Edward VIII, had to abdicate because he wanted to marry a divorcee. It was traumatic for the royal family. Throughout the 1970s, Charles was the most eligible bachelor in the world. He parted a lot, and there were girls, girls, and more girls. Not in every port, but there were a couple. There were a few that um, I, I met and liked. Uh, Divina Sheffield, one that always springs to mind. I thought she was a delightful young lady. Uh, uh, we thought there was something serious there, but. Um, it didn't happen because she had a past which is so frowned upon by certain personages. One of Charles's girlfriends even posed for Penthouse, which did not totally surprise his friend Louise, who had fixed him up with so many girls. Prince Charles, for some reason, he took a liking to me and, uh, and I helped him out and I advised him. I told him how to behave with the girls, how to treat them, not to be too nice be tough, strong, you know, manly, and, you know, and to play, you know, kind of tough and hard to get, and uh, because they all knew who he was. The most extraordinary allegation Luis makes is that at one time in the 70s, Charles shared a mistress with two other well-known polo players. One was Sarah Ferguson's father. Jane. Mm. Jane? Yeah. Jane Ward? Yeah. So what was she like? Well, she was, you know, she played the game. She was having an affair with the manager of the club. Who was that? Major Ferguson. She was in an affair with John Horswell, who was the number one player for England. And she was in an affair with Prince Charles. Well, but I knew. That you knew. <laughs> the, th the three I knew. As Charles neared 30, he was under more and more pressure to marry from his father and Lord Mountbatten. He had prescribed for Prince Charles that after a period of sowing his wild oats, he should find a beautiful, sympathetic, suitable English girl who had got no previous entanglements. Mountbatten was extremely keen that Prince Charles should marry his granddaughter, Amanda Natchbull. Um, who was a particularly charming, intelligent and attractive girl and would have made an absolute smashing queen. Mountbatten almost brought it off, I think, but he, he pushed too hard. There was uncertainty on both sides. They wanted to be left to themselves to make it up. In the end, um, the Prince of Wales had to sort of remonstrate quite firmly with his great uncle, saying, look, will you please leave us alone and let us make up our own minds in our own time and get on with it in our own way. And then, for the first time, the 31-year-old prince had to face the death of someone he loved dearly. They that go down to the sea in ships and occupy their business in great waters, these men see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. The murder of his great uncle came as an appalling shock and blow to the Prince of Wales, almost as if an arm had been cut off. He was in some way uh, at sea and rather, rather lost and had missed this was enormously important and valuable sort of sheet anchor in his life. <laughs> 
In 1981, Prince Charles did what Mountbatten had recommended and got engaged to the perfect English rose, Lady Diana Spencer. The engaged couple faced the press. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> well, it obviously you can put your means, own interpretation. Uh, obviously, it means two very happy people. Yes. Well, again, congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. The simple truth is that he wasn't in love with her. I think he knew, and he certainly knows now, exactly what love is. And I think that he was put on the spot and in an unguarded moment. He found it impossible to lie. And the prince's guru, Lawrence van der Post, was with him in spirit on the honeymoon. Charles wrote... Diana dashes about chatting up the sailors and cooks while I remain hermit-like on the veranda deck, sunk with pure joy in one of Lawrence van der Post's books. May we see your son, your Royal Highness? Then Charles made a very personal choice. He made van der Post his son's godfather. It is obviously absurd to appoint a man of 75 to be the godfather to your baby. I am convinced Charles was saying, whether he rationalised it or not, is that this man is my godfather. I put in his hands my own spiritual and moral life. Van der Post and Jung would influence Charles' ideas on medicine, religion and even architecture. Just as unorthodox were Van der Post's ideas on being faithful to one's wife. The prince must have picked up another aspect of Lawrence's life, which was that he was, to use the simple word, a womanizer. Van der Post had a wife and a long term mistress. His and Charles's intellectual hero, Carl Jung, also had two women in his life. Van der Post saw nothing wrong in the prince having a wife and a mistress. It would all lead to trouble. The marriage of Charles and Diana was meant to be the happy ending. But it was soon clear the couple were not happy at all. She loved them very much. She told me she loved them. And she must have believed initially that he loved her? Yes, yeah, so she was very disappointed, very this, this sad, you know. This, uh, if you are an above averagely bright graduate and you marry somebody with one O level, really? There comes a time very shortly when there's not a lot to talk about over the breakfast table. I think the one thing that really destroyed his confidence was his disastrous marriage to Diana. He just didn't understand what it was that, that was making Diana so unhappy. He couldn't cope. He's a very, very needy man. He needed a wife who would, who would support him, who would help him, who would be there for him, who would bolster his ego and talk to him about all the things that troubled him and worried him and, and, and he wanted to do with his life. Because she was so wrapped in her, up in herself, she couldn't give him anything. So the two of them were just poles and poles apart. Charles was also beginning to have problems with his public life. The press started to mock his passions, passions for oldie-style architecture, eccentric spiritual ideas and alternative medicine. The prince didn't make it easy for people to take him seriously because he also admitted to talking to his fruit and veg. Look, one only wants to eat one. Killer. What is it, Charles? Nothing, darling, just talking to the vegetables. He says things that I agree with. He says things that, that make sense to me. Um, he, he tries not to be politically correct, which is great. We need people not to be politically correct. We, we need people to be honest. Prince Charles has made himself a social issue. Um, probably undesirable that he um, has done so. The most worrying and dangerous of Charles's ideas are about medicine. In 1982, influenced by Van der Post and Jung, Charles started to stake out his controversial positions. He argued doctors needed to use the techniques of alternative medicine much more than they did. 
Such an approach may be described as psychotherapy or religion or the power of prayer or whatever, but it represents that invisible aspect of this universe, which, although unprovable in terms of orthodox science, as man has devised it, nevertheless cries out for us to keep our minds as open as possible and not to dismiss it as mere hocus-pocus. For the last 20 years, Charles has been sparring with one of Britain's most eminent doctors. I think he's very funny and uh, extremely likeable. But I will not patronise him. And I uh, just think he is so wrong about medicine. Well, Baum has been one of the scourges of complementary medicine for over 20 years. Um, and, and he made a tremendous outburst um, when the prince um, talked about Gerson therapy at the end of um, June last year. The Gerson diet consists of eating liquidized fruit and vegetables and having regular coffee enemas which clean out the system and fight cancer. The Gerson therapy is far from benign. Uh, effectively, the patient spends most of his or her life uh, producing this diet, uh, which to me looks extremely unappetizing. It involves buying special liquidizers, buying special vegetables, spending all day mixing up these potions, and then uh, in addition to that, uh, often associated with coffee enemas. It is toxic. Many people think alternative therapies don't do any harm, but that's not Baum's view. They can passively allow patients to die by denying them proven therapies, which we know will cure. Entirely coincidentally, two days ago, I saw a very handsome woman in her early 40s who uh, has allowed her breast cancer to progress um, to the point at which it's ulcerating through the skin and very difficult to control while she's been on some kind of cocktail of herbs and vitamins. Very sad. When he opens his mouth and says what would appear to be very stupid things coming from other people, that, you know, because he is the future king, therefore, you know, we must listen to what he says. I'm sure he wouldn't have achieved the influence that he has, you know, had he been ordinary Charlie Windsor from Basingstoke. I uh, said, well, Your Royal Highness, I can't begin to agree with you about medicine, but you're absolutely right about the architects. Throughout the 1980s, Charles attacked modern architecture, but then he wanted to do something positive, and in 1989, he announced he had a dream. Charles set about building the model village of Poundbury on his land in Dorset. Poundbury would answer his critics and realise his vision of the perfect English village. As a piece of architecture, contemporary architecture, of course, it's rather poor or rather embarrassing. As a piece of charming toy town chocolate box architecture, it's actually rather good. It depends what you want, and what Prince Charles wants here is to create a fantasy land. This is a temple of power, it really is. In fact, it's an electricity substation dressed up as a little Roman temple. I think that's rather comic, rather grandiose, and just a little bit pretentious. Now, you can see here, danger of death in this big yellow sign here. And the door's not really sort of Roman quality. This is the stuff you'd find in a DIY warehouse, really, very cheap stuff. And if you look around the corner, well, you see again, it's, um, it's part of a car park again. Poundbury is a car park. When he founded Poundbury, Charles promised ordinary people could afford to live there. It seems to me the important thing is to be able to have houses that are at affordable rents, yeah. whether they're called council houses or they're available from housing associations or whatever. I mean, that seems to me is how to ensure that those houses go on being available. But house prices in Poundbury now start at £300,000. You imagine that in Prince Charles's dreams, the people that live here would be perfect model citizens who'd touch the forelock and would never do a thing wrong. Oh, I think it's very nice, yes. I think it's very well built, yes, I like it very much. Nice shop to go to, very near. Um, nice walks, very quickly available to us. Um, I can't think of a nice place, actually. 
he, he's here today, but he just doesn't come to Fleur de Lis. He doesn't visit this part. Charles's big idea is in danger of turning sour. More big business and more big developments are coming to Poundbury as the Prince has back plans for 31 flats, some as high as five floors. If you're a, a developer, you, you've bought up a piece of land, particularly quite a small piece of land, and you can build on it very densely, lots of flats, lots of shops squeezed up, of course you make a huge profit if you manage to sell them. Well, we're upset about that, and we're very upset about that. Everyone you, uh, one talks to, you know, once you show them the plans, they seem amazed and disappointed, like, like I am. I think it's quite sad to see local residents worried about um, Poundbury in terms of it being a big business corporation, as it were, in action, and people feeling a little bit bullied and harassed by um, the duchy and by their developers. Charles has always been full of contradictions, and one is, while he always has to be totally proper in public, a lot of evidence suggests he's a very passionate man in private. Look at the Camilla Gate tape, for instance. The whole world sniggering and laughing over him saying how he, you know, he wished he was a Tampax. I'll just live inside your trousers or something. It'd be much easier. What are you going to turn into? A pair of knickers? You're going to come back as a pair of knickers? Oh, God forbid, a Tampax. Just my luck. How on earth do you hold your head up after that? I mean, you would, most people would just not. They would just want to dig a hole and climb into it. But he didn't. He carried on. And every time he is attacked and... and ridiculed, he just carries on because he believes in what he's doing. What the prince feels about medicine and building may provoke rows, but it doesn't matter constitutionally. Religion is different. Since 1534, there's never been a king or queen who did not swear to be a defender of the faith, and that faith is the Church of England. In 1994, Charles said he didn't want to be a defender of the faith, but a defender of faiths. Well, that he would like to be, in some way, uh, a person that feels that all faiths uh, lead to the same God. It's unsustainable from the Christian perspective. Uh, I wish it wasn't, but that's, that's not what Christianity teaches. But Charles has become interested in many other religions apart from the Church of England. Perhaps most controversial is the prince's attitude to Islam. He's often praised it because it's not spiritually empty like the West. It is part of our inheritance, not a thing apart. More than this, Islam can teach us today a way of understanding and living in the world which Christianity itself is poorer for having lost. I think what he admires about Islam is its, its mystical core, its architecture, and um, the way in which it has maintained a, a, an integrity um, about it. And, and he's, always, he's always talking about the, the, the more moderate um, elements of um, Islam, many of whom have been drowned out by the noise of fundamentalism. Charles's opinions and attitudes may be progressive, but if he can't take the oath to be the defender of the Church of England against other faiths, the constitutional consequences are huge. The Church would no longer be linked to the state. Its 26 bishops who sit in the House of Lords would have to leave. The Pope could even reimpose his authority over Anglicans. If he can't, in all honesty, be supreme governor of the Church of England, then... Um then perhaps abdication. The most peculiar aspect of Charles's spirituality is his interest in the occult and in esoteric Christianity. Both Charles's gurus, Van der Post and Jung, were fascinated by such strange and disturbing ideas. Van der Post even believed he was a knight of the round table and a reincarnation of the Templars who guard the Holy Grail. 
he also, in some of his dafter letters, actually claimed that he had uh, met people on his travels who were reincarnations of various, uh, various medieval figures. This was one of the ploys he used to use with millionaires who were potential uh, suppliers of cash. He would assure them that uh, they, like him, were in the tradition of even, uh, even reincarnation of the Knights of the Round Table, and they could join his glorious crusade to save the, the, the same modern society. Such beliefs are part of an obscure Christian tradition. And Charles also backs the Tenemos Academy, a small organisation which studies everything from ghosts to where the Holy Grail really is. In Greek, Tenemos means the sacred grove in front of the temple. Ten basic principles that inspire the work of Tenemos. Acknowledgement of divinity, love of wisdom as the essential basis of civilization, spiritual vision as the life breath of civilization, maintenance of the revered traditions of mankind, reminding ourselves and those we teach to look up and not down. In his garden at his home in Highgrove, Charles has built a temple to his ideas about architecture and spirituality. He's built a sanctuary. This is somewhere where he goes um, on a regular basis. It's a small building in, in a wood. It's very simple inside, uh, and uh, it's got some lovely stained glass and one or two small ornaments. And, and um, I think it's a place where you could find some peace. But any chance of peace for Charles was to be shattered. In 1996, Charles and Diana finally divorced. And then came the crash in Paris, which killed her. When Charles went to bring Diana's body back from Paris, he appeared to maintain his composure. His face carries a deep sadness. He looks downcast. It's almost etched into his face. You do see the years of turmoil and sadness. Uh, the only thing you could say at that stage that was tasteful was a huge weight had been lifted from his shoulders in the sense that she was not around anymore to snipe from the wings, to wipe him off the front pages by changing her hairstyle or wearing a new hat, and to generally discombobulate his life, which she would certainly have continued to do with some relish, I think. Oh, yes, how nice. Oh. Now it was up to him to cope with the problems of bringing up teenage sons. But Charles is much more relaxed, even in public, than his parents were with him. After all, this was where he came from. I suppose one should have sympathy for somebody who's grown up in what appears to be a deeply dysfunctional um, family. And I think his upbringing and the remoteness of his parents for most of his life and the kind of life that goes on behind the walls of Buckingham Palace and elsewhere, yes, I suppose I ought to feel some sorry for him as growing up as a child. I just can't bring myself to do that. Despite all his troubles, Charles still sometimes makes fun of himself, like when he asked Fiona Harrell just what her job as a life coach entails. So he was curious about what life coaching was, and he joked when I explained what it was. It was for people who wanted to get clear what they wanted out of life and to, to forge ahead and make that happen. And he joked and said, my goodness me, I could do with that. So actually, he's got a tremendous sense of humour. You know, he was poking fun at himself. The palace hopes that Charles's second marriage will be happy and help restore his reputation and his popularity. I could see why he has always said that his relationship with her is non-negotiable. I could absolutely see the tower of strength that she is to him. Yeah, because she's like a mother. I imagine. I, I, I can't explain anything else. And Charles hopes he'll get a more sympathetic hearing for his deeply held, but sometimes rather hard to understand, beliefs about the universe. Perhaps we just have to accept that it is God's will that the unorthodox individual is doomed to years of frustration, ridicule and failure in order to act out his role in the scheme of things. Until his day arrives, 
and mankind is ready to receive his message. We do not use the word lunatic, sir, in relation to his majesty. Charles can even take comfort from the past and has frequently defended George III, the mad king. When felons were induced to talk, they were shown first the instruments of their torture. The king is shown the instrument of his. In English discourse! This brilliant film vividly showed how George III was treated. It was so unfair, Charles argues. Perhaps because he can identify very easily with the sufferings of George. I am the king of England, no, sir! You are the patient! The fact that people question whether Charles will ever become king shows how controversial he has made himself. So now many people are asking, should Charles get the top job? When the Queen dies, I think that will be the point when there will be an increased consensus that the monarchy in this country has outlived any positive function that it might once have been perceived as having. And I think at that stage, you know, the sort of Republicans within us will start to think, well, you know, the Queen's OK, but we're not having Charlie. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, to become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. So is this the only crown Charles will ever wear? I think it's very, very, very difficult that he has to be the king in waiting for such a long time. But on the other hand, uh, we're all living longer. The Queen's going to live a lot longer. He come, hopefully Prince Charles comes to the throne and he's going to live a long time. The worst thing that could happen was f is be for his son um, to come to the throne too young. I think Charles does think he will become king. I certainly don't think he's preparing to, um, to hand over to William or to abdicate himself. No, I think he will become king. And I think, he's, um, I think, he, I think he'll be a very, very good king.